Hare-kish. So, another Sunday satsang. Seems like we just got done with last night's evening darshan, and now it's time for Sunday satsang. Oh my God, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> I guess uh, we had so many messages this morning, and so many emails, and so many comments on YouTube videos. And, whew. Yeah, well, you know, what can I say? <laughs> I'm the freak out Acharya. <laughs> we, should not, we should do like Saturday night freak outers. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, boy. Well. well, you see, the, the thing is that, that these topics, these advanced topics of devotional service, were hidden from the devotees or are hidden from the devotees in the ordinary uh, Vaishnava satsangs. The Vaishnava Sanghas, I should say. Um, they're treating this path of devotional service as a religion. In a religion, you want a nice, simple, easy, one, two, three, step by step, you know, uh, easy plan. Uh, what does it mean to become a devotee? Shave your head, put on funny clothes, and, you know, throw around all these buzzwords and then you're a devotee. No, 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 no. Being a devotee means you have a deep personal understanding of the mechanism of devotional service. How to please Krishna. How to please Krishna. Huh? What does Krishna want? Huh? Does he want you just to observe some external religious principles and, you know, give a little donation and then, you know, jump around in a kirtan and that's it? No. That's a very, very external, very superficial, preliminary understanding of devotional service. Huh? But if you listen to the people who are preaching, most of them are giving this kind of approach. They don't talk about the really deep methods. In fact, they don't talk much about the methods at all. It's like, chant Hare Krishna, take prasadam. Okay, that's it. Well, chant Hare Krishna, take prasadam. That's the beginning. But we should get beyond the beginning stage. That's the whole point. That's why Srila Prabhupada wrote so many books. If he wanted to say, start a religion on chant Hare Krishna, take prasadam, and observe the two regulative principles, you know, that would have been, he would have just wrote a simple little pamphlet. But instead, Prabhupada wrote volumes and volumes of books. Why? Just so we could sell them <laughs> to people who don't read them? I did market research on, uh, on the preaching of the Hare Krishna movement in the West. I mean, I literally went out with a clipboard in crowded places where there had been a lot of book distribution over the years. Uh, like especially in Waikiki, in, in Hawaii, in Honolulu, and like Fisherman's Wharf and, and Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And I literally went up to people and I asked them a bunch of questions leading up to basically, what do you think of the Hare Krishna movement? And 98% had a negative opinion. And I asked them, well, you bought some books? Most people said, yeah, yeah, I, I was approached and I bought some books. Did you read them? Well, no. The majority, about 60% of the people who received a book never read it. Why? Because I didn't like the attitude of the per person distributing the book was the main answer. I didn't like their attitude. They were very you know, dismissive. Here, take the book, give me some money, bye. Is that the way to start a relationship? I don't think so. If somebody treated me like that, I wouldn't want to have a relationship with them either. So we can understand that most of this preaching has been ineffective. Ineffective because, yes, they collected some money, yes, they sold some books, but the person went off feeling unsatisfied, dissatisfied. 
And then I asked, if, you read the, if they read the book, 40% read the book. Did you read the whole book? No. Why not? Oh, I didn't understand it. I, didn't, I started reading, but I, I couldn't understand anything. So I put it down. See, these books, Prabhupada wrote these books for devotees. He didn't write them for the general public. At that time, I, I realized that we needed two things. We needed a, a means of following up on our preaching to establish a relationship with the person and answer any questions they might have. And we also needed a, a, a new layer of easier to understand material and books. So I came up with the idea of writing books aimed at the general public so that they could understand the beginning ideas, the basic ideas. Now, ISKCON has tried to do this, but because they are not uh, able to restate Prabhupada's words, or Prabhupada's, more precisely, Prabhupada's concepts in their own words, in their own language, in their own vernacular. Uh, vernacular means a dialect of a language that's specific to a local area. Uh, because they weren't able to do that, they were not able to connect with their audience. You see? Back in the 60s, it was cool to be far out. Uh, the farther out you could be, the better. You know? Wear funny clothes, great. Paint, paint your face, cool. You know? Shave your hair, well. <laughs> but uh, now, what is it, 40 years later, it's not cool to be far out at all. Uh, it's cool to be rich. <laughs> so times have changed. Therefore, our approach has to change. You know, it's very simple. <clears throat> but Prabhupada gave me a specific instruction. He said, read our books and then describe, you don't have to change anything, but describe the same thing in your own words. He directly instructed me in a letter to do that. So I have Srila Prabhupada's direct instruction to do that. And I did that. And guess what? It worked. That's why you're here today looking at this video. That's why our preaching mission is gradually becoming successful not because of the quantity, or not only because of the quantity of the material that we produce, but because of the quality of it. It's pitched at the normal person. It's aimed at the average person or the intelligent person who has a desire to understand spiritual life. But it doesn't matter if you're a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, a Buddhist, an atheist, a scientist, a scholar, uh, an ordinary worker or whatever you are, it doesn't matter. By applying these same principles to your beliefs according to your faith, you'll make spiritual advancement. What we're talking about, the esoteric teaching is not a religion. It can't be a religion because a religion is invented by human beings and has a beginning and an end. See, well, We're not talking about things that have a beginning and an end because those are material. Uh, that's explained in Bhagavad Gita 2.16. The sages have determined that that which has a beginning and an end, that which is temporary, does not really exist. What is that that does not really exist? Maya. Maya. Maya means literally that which does not exist, that which is temporary. It does not have is in, intrinsically its own independent existence. Uh, if you're a Buddhist, read the Madhyamaka. The Madhyamaka says the same thing. If you're a Hindu, read Sankhya. Sankhya says the same thing. Uh, but what does really exist? That which is eternal, without beginning or end. That's real existence. That's independent existence. So what do we know? What is there in our uh, experience that is like that? Well, the soul. Consciousness, 
the self, and of course, God. Now, most of us don't have direct consciousness of God or the spiritual world, but we certainly have direct consciousness of our own soul, our own self. Huh? We can be conscious of the fact that we are conscious, and that is the beginning of spiritual life. So from there, there are many, many stages. Huh? But religion is not even on that level. Religion is below that level. Religion is still external thing that you do through the senses out there in the world. Hmm? You go to the church or the temple and then you do some worship or you do some ritual or you do, you know, some kind of service, you know, and then you come home and has anything really changed? Probably not.